there's supplements that will negatively impact your brain. I'm not cherry picking little random things. I'm actually addressing legitimate things. I have legitimate research behind them. Full disclaimer before we get into the details with this. This doesn't mean that you need to 100% avoid these things. However, I will mention the ones that I think you should 100% avoid. And then I'll mention the ones I think that maybe you should just modulate your intake of because sometimes the benefit of them does outweigh the potential downside. So let's jump into the first one. And that's one that's really hard to get these days anyway. It's not in a lot of products and there's some nuance with ephedra versus ephedrine. Sometimes you can still find products that have ephedra in it very difficult to find products that have ephedrine. Now, people immediately jump on the ephedrine thing and say, oh my gosh, it was cardiovascular risk. Personally, I think it's sketchier for the brain. So let's break it down a little bit. When you look at the total percentage that ephedrine made up of sales, it was like 0.82% of total sales. So less than 1% of total supplement sales, but it ended up making up 64% of all adverse effects. So, that's what we call the juice not being worth the squeeze, right? It didn't even make up that much of the sales, but it was a huge, huge risk. But when you look at the research, it was the research in animals that was very alarming. So there's a study published in Behavioral Brain Research. Now, this is kind of comical, but they hopped up a bunch of monkeys on ephedra. Okay, this sounds weird anyway. They gave monkeys a bunch of ephedra. And what they found is they actually ended up getting serious neurotoxicity and serious changes to their neurons. Okay, so they had actual brain neuron changes. Okay, but then in addition to this, they had behavioral changes, huge changes in irritability. So now we've got irritable monkeys hopped up on ephedra. Sorry for laughing, but that just seems kind of funny in some ways. But when we look at this, we have to remember that like when it comes down to animal models, monkeys are about as close as we're gonna get to human models. That's the stuff that's scary. Is that really worth the risk, right? Very, very, very effective for fat loss. So you ask yourself, okay, well, is it worth it for me to be overweight and have the negative implications on the brain of being overweight, or should I take a Fedra and get the weight off? That's one of those things that's up to you. Again, it's hard to find these days, but that's one of the worst things that you can do for your brain if you literally have neuronal changes. Anyhow, moving on to the next, calcium. Calcium is terrible. I do not think we should be promoting calcium supplementation. See, there is a difference between getting calcium in its true food form from dairy, you know, cheese, whatever, compared to getting it from a supplement. First of all, we have to question absorption. Second of all, calcium is very excitatory. Okay, there are some studies that demonstrate that it may actually increase dementia in those that are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. But that's not even what I'm focusing on. Okay, it stimulates the NMDA receptor. So it essentially does the opposite of what magnesium does. Where magnesium calms the brain, calcium excites the brain. And any amount of extra excitatory components within the brain can be questionable. So calcium alone, it's like, just get it from food or better yet, get vitamin D so calcium goes to the right place, right? But that's not even what I'm focusing on. Did you know that a lot of calcium supplements have heavy amounts of lead in them? There's a study published in the American Public Health Association that analyzed 70 brands, and they found that all of those brands had lead in them, ranging from 0.03 micrograms per gram all the way up to 8.8 .8 micrograms per gram. That is hugely over the FDA like toxic level, hugely above what we should be taking in. Why is lead such a problem? Well, if you look at the reviews on Environmental Health Journal, you see that lead is associated with obviously neurotoxicity. So it can like in young children affect the prefrontal cerebral cortex. So this can affect the neurobiology all the way down to developing neurodegenerative issues later on, uh, other neurological conditions, even retardation. It's not good stuff. It also disrupts calcium signaling in the first place. This is what's kind of interesting. Here you are taking a calcium supplement, which probably has lead in it, which is disrupting calcium signaling in the first place. So not only is the juice not worth the squeeze because you're getting a risk, but the juice isn't even worth the pathetic squeeze in the first place because you're not getting the calcium because the calcium signaling is impaired by the lead. So yes, it's worthless, it's a waste of money, it's a cardiovascular disease risk, but it's also a neurological risk. The next one is one that you're gonna have a hard time finding again, which is great, okay? Because it's recently been kind of taken off the shelves. And some people are gonna hate on me for this because some people liked this stuff. I took it a little bit when it was in some pre-workouts. It's called DMAA. It was popular in a lot of pre-workouts for a while. You might still see some squeak by when it's called rose geranium, 
or geranium stems or geranium seed, you might still see it squeak through because they try to like kind of change the name. That's really not being real because it's very much so synthetic. Anyhow, the issue with DMAA is not the case studies because the one main case study that really got it pulled off the shelves was that it caused intracerebral hemorrhaging. So basically a brain hemorrhage. Okay, but then when you look at further data, you find there's about five cases of ICH, of intracerebral hemorrhaging. But with that, they were usually combined with alcohol and or caffeine. So who knows what's really going on there, except for the fact that it is correlated with this. It makes me wonder, what was DMAA doing to people that didn't have huge effects? If it's causing brain hemorrhaging, it's gotta be doing something that's not that good, even at a small scale, if you're taking it all the time. Okay, there's a lot of questions to be asked with this, but it's still something that we should be cautious of. And I'm kind of glad it's not around because it's really as close to like something that's kind of dangerous as you can get, in my personal opinion. I know people like the stuff and they might have some comfort with it and not want to let go of the fact that it was a great pre-workout, but I guess you could make the argument that there's a lot of recreational drugs that aren't so good for us that would also make decent pre-workouts. Doesn't mean that we should be taking them. As far as supplements are concerned, you can shop for supplements at Thrive Market, today's video sponsor. I definitely recommend you check them out. So that's a 30% off discount link down below off your entire first grocery order. Now, you probably haven't thought of it like this when I talk about Thrive Market normally, but if you're in the market for supplements, which are usually a little bit more expensive, it might be a good opportunity to use that 30% off discount link and load up your cart with some supplements. Now, I'm not a huge, huge supplement guy. You guys know me. I take some protein powders, I take magnesium, I take a couple other things, and I biohack with other things. Bottom line is, they're still expensive, and that 30% off discount link might come in handy there. So they're your one-stop shop for groceries, but also for supplements. So 30% off plus a free $50 gift when you use that link down below. A big thank you to Thrive Market for the support in this channel, and a thank you to the viewers for checking them out to keep everything rocking and rolling. So that link's right below. Now this next one's gonna ruffle some feathers a little bit because it's caffeine, but there's context. I consume a lot of caffeine, but not as much as this is suggesting. Too much caffeine may be detrimental, okay? So there's a study that was published in Nutritional Neurosciences. It looked at almost 400,000 people from a biobank and over 17,000 of them with MRIs on file. Okay, so what they did is they correlated, which I don't always like correlational data, but they found that subjects that consumed more than six cups of coffee per day ended up having decreases in their gray matter volume, their white matter volume, and hippocampus volume. So actually having brain atrophy from too much caffeine. Now, we could also make the argument that typically people that consume a lot of caffeine, like six plus cups, are usually metabolically unhealthy, they're fatigued, they're inactive. So yes, there's all this other correlation that we can make there. But we do have some mechanistic stuff that's out there on caffeine. If this was something that was like a fly-by-night supplement we didn't know much about, it would be one thing. But we know a lot about caffeine and we do see on the tolerable upper intake and above that, that we start running into some issues because caffeine binds to an adenosine receptor. That's how it prevents you from being tired. So in, when adenosine binds to a receptor, it sends a signal to make you tired, okay? When caffeine is in the system, it binds to that adenosine receptor and blocks adenosine from hitting. This is all fine and dandy and that's why you feel alert with caffeine. What we face is a problem when this happens all the time. It can change what are called mossy fibers and pyramid cells, and this occurs when you have constant binding of caffeine to these adenosine receptors. This is where we run into a problem that absolutely could affect the brain longer term. So what is the suggestion here? It's quite simple. Keep it under five cups of coffee per day, which isn't that hard to do. If you're drinking more than five cups of coffee per day, you're finding an excuse to do so. Okay, you need to change something in your life that makes it so you don't need five cups of coffee. I've done content recently surrounding decaf and how decaf still has huge benefits of coffee independent of caffeine that might even be just as powerful as the caffeine in other areas, okay? So don't freak out. No one's telling you to ditch your coffee. You just gotta chill out a little bit. Now this next one is one that I have taken a fair bit. I haven't taken it in years, but it's yohimbine. Now, yohimbine is kind of cool because it is really good for fat loss. And the studies 
although some people poke holes in them, they're pretty good, right? And there's different downstream kind of effects, and there's also different derivatives of yohimbine. But how is yohimbine affecting the brain? What do we have to pay attention to here? Well, there's a study that was published in Psychosomatic Medicine that demonstrated that yohimbine seems to decrease cerebral blood flow. Anytime you're decreasing cerebral blood flow, it's a bad thing, right? Less blood flow to the brain makes you kind of dumber. Less blood flow to the brain could lead to neuronal cell death, right? So we do want to increase the blood flow to the brain. So is it because you have some vasoconstriction that occurs with it? Possibly. Is it a tremendous fat burner? Yes. So yohimbine is one of those things where if you can responsibly take it and you legitimately are losing weight with it, then it's probably okay in moderation because I'd rather you lose weight. That's going to have a better impact on inflammatory signaling in your brain than a little bit of yohimbine decreasing blood flow. Now, I also have a solution, something else you can take for this, but we'll talk about that in a second. But the mechanism, it is an antagonist for the alpha-2 adrenal receptor. And yohimbine is often used for erectile dysfunction and kind of getting it up a little bit. So when you antagonize the alpha-2 adrenal receptor, you essentially allocate blood and block it a little bit so that it can go down to your wee-wee. And in that case, yeah, basically you're thinking with the one head, not the other, right? That's kind of the old joke because you got more blood going there than you do going here. That could be an issue. Now, there are derivatives of yohimbine. There is one called raulcine that gives you a lot of the appetite suppressant effects that you would get from yohimbine. So that's a really cool thing too. So raulcine is an interesting alternative that may not have as much of the cerebral blood flow reduction. So at the end of the day, Nothing here is worth freaking out about. The ones that would be the most dangerous are already banned, DMAA and ephedrine. But even those, I think if you know what you're doing outside of maybe DMAA, probably not the end of the world. You just always want to use caution. And don't eat six cups of coffee per day. See you tomorrow.